Acceptance has become obligatory. It is expected, in fact, even demanded that certain behaviors be received as normal. <laughs> Actions which in my younger years and in, in the society of just a few decades ago were viewed as absolute abominations are now openly paraded and oftentimes gleefully so, you know, with no shame. And I'd like to address an example, and that is marriage has been redefined. And that change has been largely accepted by most nations in the world now. Not all, but most. Men marry men, women marry women. <laughs> it's breaking news if you follow the news, it's breaking news when yet another country or city or a you know, legal body legislates in favor of same-sex marriage. There's no shame. But that's the society we live in. Uh, this is also just one example, brethren, about the drive for unmerited acceptance illegal acceptance for that matter. Let's note what God says of his people Israel. And his message is for our time written for the ends of the ages that have come upon us. Hosea 4 I'd like to read verses 1 and 2. I suppose some of you are young enough you cannot even contrast as much as the older members in the body of Christ here the what a radical change has actually taken place but uh, it is coming to a head and here is what God says to his people Hosea 4 and verse 1 hear the word of the Lord you children of Israel now who does that apply to who is Israel is that the tiny little nation over in the Middle East occupied by the tribe of Judah at the present time no you have to come to a knowledge of who Israel is but just briefly it is the British Empire and the American people by and large bear the responsibility for the blessings that God has given because they were given to them but there are of course other nations let me continue you children of Israel for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land there is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land if you want to hear something that's often repeated it's to use God's name as an ex expletive or a filler word an exclamation but it's swearing verse 2 by swearing <laughs> and lying killing and stealing and committing adultery they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed there is no restraint look at the, the way things have progressed in our societies of becoming more and more permissive anything goes and yet another message from God is found in Isaiah 5 verses 20 through 21 <clears throat> Isaiah 5 woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Tune in, turn on the news any day and almost at any time of the day and you'll find this being fulfilled. That evil is called good and good is hated, is rejected. You know, the world population, the nations on the earth right now don't have a clue about the consequences 
which are about to take place because God is going to intervene. Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39 now, because here we find that Jesus is warning about the end time, about what would be extant just before his return to the earth in answer to what his disciples had asked beginning and you know we could begin at the beginning of Matthew 24 and see how it unfolds but I'm jumping in here he says in verse 37 of Matthew 24 but as the days of Noah were so also will the coming of the Son of Man be what does that mean the people are going to be building big big arcs <laughs> to escape hardly Verse 38, For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. The world is unaware of the intervention of God, and when God does send Christ back to this earth, they will actually treat him as an alien invader. The, the mindset is there already. Satan has prepared the world to fight against Christ to the extent that he's able to do that. But look more closely at Genesis 6, verse 5, about these days of Noah. In Genesis 5, I'm sorry, Genesis 6 and verse 5, I just want to give this short verse the, the evaluation that is presented here by God about the people of that time then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and here we're talking about not just one little nation or parcel of land in the Middle East but rather in the earth all over the earth because the flood was sent to destroy the surface of the earth to disrupt what had been created by man, to wipe it out and to start all over. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. We see that as a similar description of our society today, don't we? Isn't that an exact description of the way things are going? When is the God of the Bible worshipped and respected and held up with great awe and reverence rather than being a byword, a swear word, as if you please? Well, brethren, in one way or another, all of this affects you. How? Why? Because you, brethren, are a Christian. You are, are different. Now, being different might be sometimes a problem, right? Well, it, it is already if you want to raise your kids in a certain way, if you want to live in a particular society without just going along with it. Because you are a Christian, you're different. Now, let's go to John 17 and read what Jesus Christ said because here we find then in this epic prayer of his before God, just before his crucifixion, he had some things to say and he said a lot about his church, the people that he was leaving behind and the ones that he would additionally deal with in the future. John 17 and I'll read beginning in verse 9 through verse 16 first, but let me make this as we go into this point, as I go into these verses, that Jesus made an absolute distinction between his followers and the world. John 17 and verse 9, he says to the Father here, I pray for them speaking of his disciples 
not just the twelve, but all of his disciples, both then and going forward. I do not pray for the world. I'm not, I'm not going to fix this world in its on its terms, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. We had best be glorifying God by withstanding the world and Jesus Christ. We should glorify as well if we do that. Verse 11, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. So we call the church of God the church of God. Here we, it's the church of the eternal God, but we are being kept in the name of the Father of God. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Kept them how? Well, separate from the world. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. As we heard in the earlier announcement, and it's more than time and chance for members of the Church of God when these things happen. Because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Let's see how far I want to keep reading here. I'll stop in that verse and pick up verse 18 because this is important to understand brethren as you sent me into the world I also have sent them into the world not to become part of it not to save it rather as Matthew 24 verse 14 says to lift the voice of warning and of really the only good news that will ever come to this world is the promise of the coming of the kingdom of God under the guidance of Jesus Christ. Let me ask, are you among those spoken of by Jesus here? Are you different from the world as he prayed that his disciples would be? I have a checklist for you. Things that make Christians different. I'm not going to number each one I'm, because of the way it progresses. It's kind of a natural thing we've all gone through, and I'll let you test your memories as I go along and see how it fits. But it's a checklist. You're different if you have been called. where I'm going first. We heard earlier in the sermonette uh, this verse read, but I want to read it now in the context of my sermon. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Because the point I'm making here, what the point of difference is the fact that you have been called and that statement comes up often. I'm going to give you several scriptures to, to back that up. How important that is to, to make sure that you are different. Have you been called by God? Really? First Peter 2 and verse 9, But you are a chosen generation. And as I go through these words, drink them in a little bit. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So all of these 
descriptive words are supported by the fact that we have been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. To be called, brethren, you must be called by God. You don't call yourself. This is not a voluntary walking down the aisle to accept the Lord. That's not the way it works. John 6, verse 44. John 6 and verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Now think about this. God the Father chooses who he wants to be among the first fruits. To be in his very church, the church that bears his name. And you can't come to Jesus Christ unless the Father is drawing you, but there's even a little bit more here to the formula if you want to look at it that way. John 14 and verse 6. <clears throat> These statements made here by Jesus Christ are foundational and again the point that I am making is that you're different if you have been called we need to re be reminded of how that has occurred in our lives. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God draws people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Savior and Christ opens the way. He said even in John and subsequent chapters here and verses he said when you pray ask in my name and he opened the way the access to the Father which in times past was not open not like it is now for Christians. Again Christ saying I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me. So this calling involves a definite series of steps and occurrences in one's life. Let's look how Paul addressed the brethren. I'd like to go to Romans 1 verses 1 through 7 and read the opening statements here in this book. Romans 1 verse 1, Paul a bondservant of Jesus Christ call to be an apostle. He didn't choose it. Quite the opposite. We know his, his history. It's written very poignantly in the book of Acts. God called him to be an apostle. Separate, separated to the gospel of, of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ He's, he's contrasting all of these nations. The message is going out, he's saying, as an apostle, he's preaching this truth of the Son of God. And then very specifically address, addresses the church in Rome here, the brethren, and saying, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. So evidently it's important to be among the called based on Paul's writing. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 again an introductory chapter that in which Paul is speaking to a different group of Christians here 1st Corinthians 1 verses 1 and 2 Paul called and to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother 
he makes this point that his authority, his apostleship is because God called him to it. But continuing to the church of God which is at Corinth to those who are sanctified, set apart in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. You're different because you've been called to be saints, brethren, with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Who else has been called into that fellowship in the world? How do you know? Look at their fruits. Look at their understanding, or probably more exactly their lack of understanding. Verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Do you see your calling? Do you understand that it makes you different? And as we will see in the next set of scriptures, it also bears, passes on some responsibility to us. Let's go to Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. Paul adds the dimension of responsibility where a response on our part is required. It's not just a matter of being called, it's a matter of us answering that call, but the beginning point is for God to call us. That's what separates us from the world. You might be sitting with a person to your left and to your right. You may be in a family and find yourself all alone because you only have been called. And even Christ said, I didn't come to, to bring peace. And he talked about how family members would be set against one another. But now let's read in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, walking in a worthy manner, puts responsibility on us, with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That has proven to be a real challenge among those called in the various groups now as everyone kind of has a unique approach. But even there, with all the confusion, there's a way to the light and that's by obedience to what this book reveals. Let me continue. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Paul makes the point that we have some responsibility in this calling, but there's one way. You know, as Christ said, you don't come to the Father except through him and you don't come to Christ unless God draws you. One calling, brethren. Is that enough? Will that keep you different? Galatians 1, 6 through 10. Back up chapter here, or a book. Galatians 1, verses 6 through 10. Now we're talking, to, Paul is writing to Christians who have been established, but have let false doctrines come in, especially around the issue of circumcision. He said, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, that you've, you've moved away to something else, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert 
the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to the, you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For I do I now persuade men, or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So we see that in this calling, the challenge continues. Can you remain different? Well, what happens with this calling is the world creeps back in. <laughs> to me, we are walking in a territory in which Satan has surrounded the earth with a bunch of his flypaper, so to speak, sin. The pleasures, the passing pleasures of sin. And every once in a while, we make the mistake to step over the edge and get stuck into that and it sometimes it's pretty hard to get unstuck and sometimes people don't they go to another gospel which is not a gospel not good news second Thessalonians 2 verses 13 through 14 I'm spending a lot of time on this calling point here to reinforce this first aspect I'm bringing up. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 13 through 14 said, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. You were called, you were chosen for this purpose. To which, in verse 14, he called you by our gospel for obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a purpose for this calling, and I'm coming to that in 2 Timothy. I'm, I'm sorry, we'll go to 1 Timothy. Again, talking about being called. 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 through 12. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 11, But you, O man of God, and Paul is here encouraging a young minister in the church, You, O man of God, flee those things and pursue righteousness, goodness, or godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. How does, where is he supposed to pursue those things? Well, of course, in his role as a minister. Continuing in verse 12, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Called for what purpose? Here we come to it. You have been called, brethren, to eternal life. And boy, does that make you separate from this world. They haven't been called to eternal life. It's not that they won't eventually be but you are, as we will again rehearse as Pentecost rolls around not too long now, when we get into June, but we will be reminded of the first fruits in the plan of God. Called to eternal life, and not only just to eternal life, but to be among the first fruits. Now let's continue. You are different if you have repented. Now I know we have to repent more than once, don't we? It's part of our growth that Rob was talking about in the sermonette, developing a relationship with God. But you, brethren, if you've truly repented, you are different than the world because you haven't just been sorrowful You've changed. 
Matthew 4 and verse 17, let's, let me open up with this because it's something that Jesus Christ said that we are required to do as a Christian. Matthew 4 and verse 17, this is the way he began and this is the way he ended his ministry. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When the day of Pentecost did come, that first one when the church sprang into existence, here is the message from Peter inspired by God in Acts 2 verse 38. People wanted to know what to do. And some of them of them actually did what Peter is talking about as we read the full context of this in subsequent chapters. Acts 2 and verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm letting you into some other points here in this one sweeping statement by Peter, but right now let me just address this starting point, that following the calling Next comes the need to repent. What kind of repentance? <laughs> Acts 11, verse 18. We see, in just by review in, in Acts 2, it was a matter of those in the area of the temple in Jerusalem that heard these powerful messages from Peter and the other apostles on the day of Pentecost. And that's all well and good because those were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But something else happened along the way because Peter was sent to a Gentile family and they received the Holy Spirit. And it, you know, created some wonder among the Jews, the converted Jews at the time. And I'm breaking into the story here in Acts 11, verse 18. When they, and that would be the brethren of that, at least at that stage, when they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. And here we see the key. What? Why repent? Why respond to this calling? Why go through these things? Repentance opens that door to life. Not the physical life that we're talking about. Spiritual life. Eternal life. Then it's to really kind of nail this down. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 9 through 11 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 9 let me I need to turn turn there real quickly get some Okay, now, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, because Paul had just really severely and, and dramatically chastised the Corinthian church for their permissiveness, for moving away from the truth of the gospel, and for allowing sin, for evil, to come into the church. But they repented. Now I re rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, again, life, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. 
For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication, in all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this manner. That is the kind of repentance that God will accept. So if you are faced with that as a challenge, turn over to 2 Corinthians 7 and read verse 11. <laughs> it kind of shake you up. I know we, we tend to easily remember Psalm 51. Let's pick up a little bit there because, again, I'm talking about repentance, but genuine. I think it's important to identify the, the need for genuine repentance when it comes to answering the call of God. Psalm 51. Let's read a few verses here, beginning in verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. And we can put ourselves in David's place because we know what he's repenting of here. The terrible sin where he committed adultery and then murder and then in essence lied to those around him. But he couldn't lie to God. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. We're appealing to God's great mercy when we commit these grievous type of sins. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Who in the world is doing this? What leader in all of the world is down on his knees confessing his sins or being like a Daniel repenting of the sins of the nation as we can read in his actions. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight. That you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. And he spoke, and he judged, and he sent Nathan to Daniel to remind, not only remind of David of his sins, but to bring about the judgment that had fallen on David. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Now that's a different kind of sorrow than the world has. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, and do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. This is the kind of repentance that God accepts. And if this is the way you have repented, and are willing to repent when it is necessary, you're different. You're different if you have received God's Holy Spirit. Now let's go back to, and I'll just remind you of Acts 2, 38 that I just read earlier, but the promise here is that we would receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit if we repented. If we were baptized, and it again is because of Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 3 and verse 16.
you are different because you have received God's Holy Spirit. Not the spirit of this world. Remember what I read in Matthew 24, how the world is not even going to know about the return of Jesus Christ, nor at least not understand it. They will certainly, those alive will see the events, but not understand. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Does that make you different? <laughs> I think so. And while we're here, let's just drop back up to 1 Corinthians 2, this time also verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. How? How are these things possible? Because we have the very spirit emanating from God, and that includes the Father and Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he would make his home with us, but not only him, that his Father would too. And let me just to reinforce that, let me see if I can pick that up in Yes, in John fourteen and verse twenty three. And in fact I'll pick it up with a statement from one of the disciples in verse twenty two of John 14, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? <laughs> There's a separation there. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him through the Holy Spirit. And that makes us dramatically different than the world if we have God's Holy Spirit. Romans 8, I'd like to read verses 8 through 11 here. Romans 8, and verse 8. <clears throat> So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Who is this talking about, brethren? The whole world. All of humanity, except for those who have been called. Verse 9, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now notice, in this verse, it's talking about both the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ being in us. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit which dwells in you. I hope you're picking up a little bit of a theme as I go through these different aspects of being different. It keeps coming back to the concept of life, of being given life, and of course that life given to a mortal body is spiritual life, eternal life. Now, a, a final aspect here before I'll have a little bit more in the conclusion, but you're different if you are overcoming. That makes you different than the world, brethren. If if the world would overcome, none of the chicanery, none of the vile wickedness, the evil that is extant 
today would be allowed. If someone stands up now, they're snuffed out like a putting a cup over a candlelight. If they stand up for good in legislatures or in governments, you know, recently in Oklahoma, the the, the ruling body there, the legislature wanted to pass a law that would outlaw doctors performing abortions. They were going to make it a felony. The governor, through various machinations of her thinking, because I believe that she's a possible running mate for Mr. Trump, decided to veto the law. Now this is again just a, one example, but in no place does murder find a defense, the act of murder, find someone who will really stand up and be successful to, to defend it. You're different if you are overcoming. Romans 12 verse 21 Romans 12 and verse 21, we have this admonition. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is our quest. <laughs> As the words from the song might have, our quest is to overcome evil with good. How do we do this? How is this even possible? Romans 12 verses 1 through 2, same chapter here. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. transformed by the renewing of our minds to have the very mind of Jesus Christ in us to be able to react and do as Jesus Christ would in all of the circumstances that confront us. Again, you're different if you are overcoming. <clears throat> First John 4 and verse 4 <clears throat> I suppose if I could give, if you want a, a short version of this whole sermon, it would be the book of 1 John about contrasting Christians to the world. So much is said there. 1 John 4 and verse 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the, the world. We have the mind of Christ, we have the Spirit of God, and so it is said here that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Again, the contrast between Christians and the world that is out there. I'm just seeing if I want to pick up a little bit more in John here. In verse 11 of chapter 5 of 1 John, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Again, the message of John throughout, and I'll, I think I'll come back to that in just a little bit. But God has given us something special if we are overcoming. It's something we already have. Revelation 21 and verse 7. Here's a wrapping up scripture, if you please. Uh, kind of putting the whole Bible in perspective. Revelation 21 and verse 7. The statement is made. Let's pay attention to it. He who overcomes 
shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son my daughter an eternal member in my family is what this verse is relating so I guess it's important that we overcome if we're going to expect to inherit all things and there are things to inherit it's called the kingdom of God for all of eternity now I'm going to give you just a little bit more in a conclusion Romans 8 verse 30 it all comes down to this It's interesting, we were getting some coffee here in the hotel a little bit earlier and we've gotten to know the, some of the staff and the lady kind of asked us about our what we're talking about because her husband is a minister but I <laughs> kind of volunteered and I said what well, I'm talking about um, how being a Christian is different and she says well how can you condense that hour and a half's worth of talking to um, a minute or so there are a few seconds which I attempted to do it's interesting perspective but Romans 8 and verse 30 because I, here comes this condensation I want to come to condensing what this sermon is about remember the title is you you are different Romans 8 and verse 30 moreover whom he predestined that is God those he also called whom he called these he also justified that's yeah, receiving his Holy Spirit that is overcoming and whom he justified, these he also glorified. I like the tense of how this is presented because it's as good as done. That we are as good as glorified if we continue in this way. And another cornerstone scripture is Revelation 17 and verse 14. says here in the book of Revelation this portrayal is given to us talking about the world out there who are alive and fighting against Christ when he returns these will make war with the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and those those being what we would like to understand or do understand being Christians saints those set apart for this calling to be first fruits those who are with him are called chosen and faithful another way of saying pretty much what I've been talking about in the points I presented earlier let's go back to first John 5 I think I'll conclude right here in these scriptures. First John 5, verse 11. Again, let me read that. <clears throat> and this is a testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. We have eternal life now in Christ Jesus. Verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God don't give up don't walk away don't go back into a leisurely walk on Satan's flypaper the sins of this world then in verse 20 and we know that the Son of God has come and, and, and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ this is the true God and eternal life 
Christians are different. And if we boil it down, among all of the other things I've talked about today, the world doesn't have what we have. It can't have unless it goes through all of those steps. Brethren, we have in Christ Jesus and by the very word and promise of God the Father, we are different because we have eternal life.